distance properly. <laughs> so, sorry, we have to have, we have to laugh about this stuff because this has just been a strange, very strange time. Uh, so my name is Eric Rappin. As uh, Volker said, I'm an Agile coach. I spent a lot of time training. Um, I've been in software for over 30 years. Started out as a software engineer many, many years ago. Been in a lot of different roles. Spent a lot of time in management. Since March, <clears throat> as we all know what happened, or I should say what's happening, <laughs> it's not like it's gone away. Um, I've done, I definitely have been on Zoom over 800 hours at this stage. I think I'm maybe getting closer to nine. Uh, I've learned a few things and, you know, I've always been a big fan of personal in person, you know, do this stuff in person because it makes so much of a difference. And some of you know me and have experienced that and we've done stuff together and, you know, yeah, I'm a huge fan. So I was not too happy to go remote. And you know what, sometimes, you know, necessity drives you to do things you never thought you'd be doing. So, you know, after a while, you have to do it. Um, and after a lot, a lot of practice, uh, I've definitely learned a few things. And what we're gonna do, Ed, my brother Ed, who's here to help me, Ed's been my um, big help in uh, this whole endeavor. And what I'm gonna do is, we're gonna share a mural link. So I've been using a tool called Mural. And you see the link in the uh, Zoom chat. And go ahead and click in there. Now, I will warn you, we are probably pushing the limits of mural by having so many people into a single mural at one time. Uh, the very first class I did in March was a product owner class. And um, I had 15 people. I had one big mural. And I had everybody interacting on this one big mural. And um, it did not go so well. So I normally split it up into small group work. And I'll talk more about that later. But the scaling on mural but you know they just got a bunch of money they got a 118 million dollar b series funding round so i have a feeling you know we've been seeing a lot of changes showing up in mural so now for those of you who suddenly noticed that your view in mural changed it's because i'm facilitator in mural and i can summon you to it so one of the things i like about mural is that the facilitator has a bit of control i'm curious uh Put in the Zoom chat. I'd, I want to ask a few questions as we go, but put in the Zoom chat. First off, it'd be interesting to find out who's here. So if you want to just do a very brief, you know, who's here's who's who, here's who's here, and yeah, and actually, for those of you who can't get into Mural, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen just so you can see what I'm talking about. So if you're in Zoom, this is you know this is another way to look at this in case you're having trouble getting in, into Mural. Or especially if you're behind a firewall that doesn't allow you to use tools like Mural, which I, I, I do understand. So you should be seeing a big welcome screen. And I'm seeing a few people in here. I'm going to just give it a moment because it does take time. Oh, should we introduce here. ourselves? Because the names are visible. So. Okay, do it. What, uh, what, what we're doing in our day job or color of our eyes. Go for it. I see that, Bernie. <laughs> yeah, that made me laugh out loud for sure. We're doing eye color. I'm sorry, I missed something along the way here. I think that just I think happened. I derailed you a little bit. <laughs> no, no, you're okay. I'm like, you like, may need to redirect it. Okay. <laughs> uh, all right, I'll throw mine in too, you know? Why not? Um, all right, cool. So it looks like we got quite a few people in here. 
And you can see it, if you can't get into Mural, you can see it in the um, in uh, Zoom, because I'm sharing it there as well. Um, how many people are? 27. All right, that's not too bad. All right, it looks like most people are in. Uh, one of the things you get to do when you're a facilitator in Mural is anytime you need to celebrate something, you can do this. Oh, cool. <laughs> All right, so I'm just gonna, you know, I already did kind of a brief introduction. Uh, I actually here, I, I, I do live here in San Francisco. I do wanna make a very brief shameless self-promotion here. My brother, Ed, who's here and I, we um, published a board game called Plunder Straits, pirate themed board game. You can buy it online. That's the end of my shameless self-promotion. I do wanna give a shout out to my brother because I'll tell you, when you get to a certain point when you're kind of, are you gonna trade off between facilitating lots of what's going on in Zoom, which is what Elena and we and Volker and all these people are dealing with right now, um, or are you gonna be teaching, facilitating, training, coaching, whatever it is you're doing with the tool? Ed has been a huge help, so this has been working out great. Traditionally, in my in-person classes, Ed draws all kinds of amazing art to describe the contents of what we're teaching. Season and, and Olaf and a bunch of other people have seen this stuff in action. I give it a little sample here. Um, and then of course that picture there is a piece of artwork that's on my wall. You can see it behind me here. So uh, anyway, cool bro, I, I'm happy we get to work, in, work together. So for those of you who are in Mural, we're gonna try something. This is a little experiment. Now I will say, uh, given that Mural is not crazy for scaling, although they may have invested in it, perhaps we have, uh, underestimated where they are at this point. We're gonna make a little test. So one of the things I'm gonna do is hide the cursors. If all those cursors is driving you crazy, by the way, if you find your little icon at the bottom left, there's a little menu there, it'll say, don't show me cursors, you can hide those. That can be a little distracting when you have this many people in here. We're gonna use dot voting just for as a little quick check-in, just see how everybody's feeling. And I'm not sure how it works with 20 some odd people in it. I've only gone up to, I think, 20, maybe 20 with this. And I'm gonna turn on voting. And the way it works is I turn on voting, I give everybody a vote. When the voting shows up, you wanna say, okay, yep, yeah, begin voting. And then you click on the words. See where it says delighted, happy, okay, meh, unhappy, perplexed. You wanna click somewhere on that rectangle that's a little bit light gray, because if you click anywhere else, that's what you're voting on. Because unlike a Post-it with a Sharpie, this is a software program and it's very precise. So if you don't see a little red dot showing up in the upper right corner of that little text box, you voted somewhere else, whatever you clicked on, if you shift click, it'll subtract the vote and then you can click somewhere else. And if it doesn't work out, don't sweat it, we'll talk about it and in fact, part of that process of it not working for you is kind of some of the things we're gonna talk about. So I'm gonna go ahead and start voting here. So let me do that. So I'm gonna name it. I'm gonna give everybody one vote. Give everybody allowed to vote and begin voting. Go ahead and start voting. The voting, the reason I like this kind of dot voting is because it's anonymous. Oh. If you dot vote, it goes into the tally. If you don't use a different tool, just click on the word. Let me just check. All right, most people have voted. There's a couple people who haven't. Looks like we're about done now. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end it. So we end the voting session and when I end it, you get to see the summary and you can dismiss this, there's a little X mark if you wanna dismiss it, but basically nine people are happy, four are okay, three are delighted, two are meh. Hey, nobody unhappy or perplexed. Well, that's probably a good thing, huh? Um, I like this because with in-person dot voting, it's anchored, isn't it? 
First person who goes up and makes a mark has shown everybody else how to vote. This does not work that way. So, you know, sometimes it, digital tools can have some advantages. All right. Any comment on any of that at this point? Anybody curious? I'm curious to know if other people have been using similar kinds of tools. If you want to just pop a name of a tool into the uh, Zoom chat, I'm just sort of curious to see if people have been using things like Mural or Miro. Yeah, Miro. Uh, there's a bunch of these. Yeah, there you go. Cool. Because there's a lot of these tools out there. Mural is only one of them. But if you're following along in my main Mural or if you're watching what I'm sharing in Zoom, uh, I'm going to talk about three basic things. Design principles, some facilitation techniques, and the least important part, which is tools and technology. I'll touch on it a little bit. If we run out of time, you know how it goes with the prioritized list. Eh, we leave that stuff behind. But I will preserve this mural as a PNG, and I will be letting everybody have a copy of this. So you'll have all this stuff afterward. And in fact, most of this mural is really just reference material. So I just captured a lot of stuff because there's a lot of text in here, and I would normally never create something with so much text in it. But hey, let's go with it. So design principles, simple, simple, simple. You cannot possibly underestimate what simplicity does when you're doing remote stuff. It is absolutely essential. And in fact, the fewer tools you involve people in, the better. Of course, it depends on your audience. I'm currently in the middle of a client engagement right now where I'm not worried about tools because they're super technical savvy. They're picking stuff up super fast, but I teach a lot of public classes. In fact, most of my stuff is public classes. And I'll tell you, you know, you just never know who's going to show up and you never know what part of the country or the world they're going to be in from now. I'm teaching people, I should have done a data visualization on locations. Actually, I should think about that. Um, I've got people in, we have currently somebody in uh, our Buenos Aires, Vermont, a um, bunch of them are in San Jose and Utah, and I've had people in Tokyo and Potsdam, Germany, and, uh, you know, Sao Paulo, and you name it. So it's kind of freaky now at this point. So the fewer things you do that you having people saying, here, you got to figure this out, the simpler your job is going to be facilitating. And of course, when you do design stuff, less cluttered is better. You know, it's simple, simple, simple. Uh, one thing you, you don't want to neglect is how you appear on camera. It's really important. I invested in a bunch of lights. I've got a light behind me that kind of pops from behind and I got a light down here. You know, I bought a better camera. You know, if you're going to be doing this a lot, you probably want to invest in some equipment. Uh, I mentioned how mural doesn't scale when you pile on too many people all at once. You should test that beforehand. <laughs> um, I did a lot of testing. Um, and also, I also recommend that you should always assume that people have the smallest possible screen available. I think everybody has a 13 inch laptop screen. Because if they, if you don't design for that format, because I've got this big 4k monitor here and then, you know, and it's like, yeah, that's fine for me, but it's not working for people who are working off like a MacBook Air. Right? Uh, test, test, test. I can't, I, I spent 10 years in QA. I can't emphasize testing enough. Every time you think you nailed something, go and put it in front of somebody that you think might give you some good feedback and ask them what they think. Olaf would actually played a big part in a lot of the testing of a bunch of my materials. He can attest to the fact that I, I abused the man a lot of, a lot of his time. <laughs> Sasha's seen a bunch of my stuff. There's a bunch of other people in here who know what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, it's really valuable to test up because it, nothing, if you've learned from Agile, real feedback on real things should teach you a lot more than anything else you could possibly think you're doing. When you're starting to segment your designs and thinking about groupings and do I have like random groups and people like this, right? We're going to be trying something in here that we haven't tried, I guess, hasn't been tried at BLN, which is we're going to allow you to navigate around breakout rooms. I don't do that in my classes because I assign people. So it really depends on what you're trying to do. 
but you need to think about that problem is like, how am I segmenting the work? How am I dividing things? How are we doing breakouts? Is it more random? Is it more fixed? Is it a little combination of both? Are we going to do pairing? We actually talked about having like, if you had 20 people in a something, having 10 breakout rooms and there's always an opportunity now to pair if you did it that way. I haven't tried it yet, but I've been thinking about all these. There are a bunch of structural things you have to think about when you do this stuff. Keep it short, keep the energy up, make sure you mix up what you're doing. Don't forget old training from the back of the room. For those of you not familiar, Sharon Bowman, you know, good stuff. It still applies here, even though her stuff is really geared at in-person, the principles still apply. You just have to turn them into what does it mean virtually? And I'll tell you, one of the things I found saved me a huge amount of time was when you're introducing a tool, like I was introducing Mural to most of the time, I'm introducing Mural to most people who've never seen it before. And I'll tell you what happened the first couple of times I did it. It was painfully slow. And in fact, in general, you should always assume everything that goes on virtually is going to be slower. Everything is slower. So what I did to help kind of move things along is I created a little mini tutorial where I actually send out a link to a mural before class. And I have them actually practice a little bit of mural. I don't give them a whole introduction. I just give them the things I think they really need to know, which is how to navigate around. But it has sped things up so much, so much. Um, now my next project is I'm going to shoot some video so I can send that out beforehand and some subtract some of the explanatory stuff in my classes so I can increase the amount of content. What I'm going to do now, we're going to disrupt. So uh, we just talked about design principles. I'm going to talk about facilitation techniques, but before we do, I kind of want to break this up with a little bit of activity. I really have no idea how this is going to turn out. We're really kind of pushing the boundaries here. But what we're going to do is I'm going to share a, let me make sure I get this right. Yeah. I have a Google Sheet document that has 12 links in it. And the reason is, is because we have 12 breakout rooms and we have 12 murals that match those breakout rooms. And what's in each mural is a sampling of some of the stuff that I've been doing as activities in my trainings. I just grabbed a couple of things that I thought were kind of interesting that would kind of stand alone on their own. And so every single breakout room has the exact same activities in them. I think there's five. There's two for my Scrum Master class, there's two for my Product Owner class, and there's one that's kind of a retrospective activity. When you pick a breakout room, and we're not going to assign these to you, so if you upgraded to Zoom 5.4, you'll be able to freely navigate around the Zoom rooms. If you didn't, it's fine. There's a bunch of us who are going to be hanging out here in the Zoom main room. We'll be able to get you off to a room. But I'm going to give you the links to this, but I don't want to hand it out quite just yet because I know what will happen as soon as I do. So, <laughs> um, and facilitation tip, right? Don't give things out until you're ready to do it. Um, so 12 murals, 12 room, yeah, 12 murals that have five activities on each one. There's also a space on each of these murals called aha moments. And you can navigate to everything in the mural if you look at the outline, and I'll show you what I mean. If you go back to what look, you know, either in the main mural or if you're looking in Zoom, that thing on the right where they have all the titles of everything that's going on, though, that's the outline. You can navigate that way. So when you go to this mural, when you get to the breakouts, I'll tell you, there's one of the items at the very top. Just like I, I forgot to introduce the parking lot at the very top of this one. There are aha moments in those murals. If you have an inspiration, a question, something comes up like, ah, Go ahead and write it in there because I'm always looking for, you know, insights, feedback, you know, trying to understand this stuff better. There's always room for improvement. So without further ado, uh, before I drop this on anybody, um, anybody have any kind of questions at the moment, just kind of throw that out there.
And Eric, th this might seem obvious, but uh, each mural link is numbered and that's the room it corresponds to. Even though all the rooms are empty right now and all the murals are the same, if you're in breakout room one, you'll be working on breakout. That's right. Mural so everything is numbered one through 12. The murals are one, numbered one through 12. The breakout rooms are numbered one through 12. And here's the thing. There's how many people in here? 28 people. So, you know, if there's too many people in a room, go to another room. If it gets a little crowded, once you get to about five people, it's a little crowded, go to another room. Just make sure that when you go to the other breakout room in Zoom, you go to the other mural that matches that breakout room. <laughs> How's it going, Joe? <laughs> yes, you're gonna be self-assigning. So the way we're setting up the breakout rooms is, they're all, when, once I stop sharing, because I have to stop sharing, I think, to allow this to happen. Um, in fact, I'll do that right now. The breakout rooms are there already. So at the bottom of the Zoom window, you can choose the breakout room feature and all 12 rooms are there. You can choose what room you wanna to go to. And then I am now putting Google Sheets. That's the link to the Google Sheet. And all 12 mural links are there. So they match the number of the breakout rooms. Have at it. I'm gonna set a timer and let me show you how I do this in my classes. What do you think, uh, Volker? 10, 15, I think? 10 sounds great. Okay, let's do 10. So let me do 10. I'll set my timer. And I'll talk about tools later, but uh, one of the things I'm doing is um, a bit of OBS. So. Go ahead and hang up, go out to the breakout rooms, go check out these murals. If you have questions, you can always pop back here and ask questions and uh, we'll see you in 10 minutes. Now for anybody who's still hanging out here in the main Zoom room, um, it would be interesting to find out if you need anything while you're here, if you need a link or something. Eric, how do you go to a room? So in the bottom of the Zoom window. So I've got the I've got the breakout rooms up. I've got it. My I've got so now you just click. I think there's a little pull down menu on the far right, and you can join that room if you click on that pull down. Ah, oh, there it is. And if you need to see the timer, you need to have the main mural open also in another browser or another tab. Or something. Uh, no, actually, I didn't set that in. Actually, that's oh. where I should set it. That's a good point, Ed. Let me fix that. Sorry, I'm so used to the class. Yeah, 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 no, I should have done that. Let me stop that and I'll set it in here. Cool, you got a better timer going. One that's shared. That's actually, for those of you hanging out here, um, if you're looking at that mural that I shared initially, there's a timer at the top. And if you're sharing stuff in Zoom, you can't, people can, breakouts can't see what you're sharing in the main Zoom room, right? But if I set a timer here and everybody has access to that page, then they can all see the timer. Who in this main, who in the main room had either trouble joining a breakout group or is discovering that they're still on an older version of Zoom and can't and need some help with joining a breakout? Yeah, Volker, I was going to wait till the room sort of cleared out and just ask you to put me in one that isn't as populated, so. Cool. Nice. I think I'm, I'm on an older version, so I don't see the breakout rooms. We can assign you and then a, a dialogue will come up to tell you to join it. Who was asking for help with getting into a breakout? Pop it. We have it. Uh-huh. Who else? Who else wants some support getting into a breakout? Call out your name. Rob, you're talking, but I can't see you. How's it going, Rob, by the way? Nice to see you. <laughs> of course. Uh, I have 5.03. Is that the latest version? No, 5.4. Mm -hmm. um, I'll assign you. All right. You're gone. Yeah, we can we can send you off somewhere. Don't worry. Michael, how about you? You need some help? Uh 
Uh -huh. Maybe not here anymore. Christina. I'll just allow you to join one. Lena, do you want to join a breakout? We know Inigo has the current version because he's got the filters. You know who that is, right? <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> That's Bernie. <laughs> Now it's just us. Recording. And we're recording. Absolutely. All right. I'll I think I'll just hop into a breakout, have a look. I mean Cool. Do. I'd love to have I'd love to hear flies on the wall. And I go I'm going to pass on the experience. I'm curious if we'll get the answers to the bias exercise. Oh, thank you. For asking. Uh, so uh, I do include a panel in the main mural that I sent out originally. I'll reveal it at the very end, and it'll be in there. Yes. So yes, I did think about that. I'm like, I got to give the answers because. <laughs> I, I want to say Nick, I haven't. I haven't used like the breakout rooms, and I've been meaning to, or haven't had the opportunity to do it. I, I kind of like it. I like the setting up a room, especially in an open space format, see who's there and say like, oh, I don't know anybody there. So I'm just going to go jump into that room and get to know them. Uh, that's kind of fun. Uh, even when, even when the rooms are pre assigned. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, I was, I was going to say, yeah, no, I would say like, it's kind of interesting just to let, especially Agile is self-organized into groups in that way. You know, I don't know if I would do that with like a bunch of random students, you know, but uh, well, actually with, with Agile students, it's probably fine. But if they're like non Agilists, I don't know, I, I would probably pre assign or randomly assign. Um, but that's good. And, and I like the exercises that you set up because it was a good way. I do, I do acknowledge that there are problems with newbies learning how to learn how to do um, mural very quickly. And, and I thought the fill in the blank exercise was pretty good. So doing some sort of like icebreaker around that is a really good way to get their feet wet. Yeah, that's cool. I'm glad you noticed that. Um, yeah, definitely, um, you know, you can't assume, you know, it, it's good to just keep things simple, mm -hmm. right? And make it as basic as possible because you don't want to focus on stumbling around the tool, right? I mean, one of the reasons people favor post-its and flip charts and whiteboards is because they're simple. So how do you get as close to that with electronic tools as possible? Well, electronic tools do have slight enhancements. There are things you can do. For example, one of the things I do an exercise, a, uh, it's any, I'm sure a bunch of you are familiar with constellations. I know Volker is very familiar with constellations. Um, and I use something called Lean Canvas, which I'm sure most of you are aware of, a lot of you are. And I used to tape down a Lean Canvas on the floor of a classroom in blue tape. And then I would do kind of like a human heat map. I would ask a series of questions, six questions, and have people move to places on the Lean Canvas that answered that question best for them. It was a great exercise. I loved it. It was awesome. And then it's like, okay, how do I do that virtually? Well, I have a lean canvas and mural and I gave everybody a little round sticky. They put their name on it. And when I asked them the question, they dragged the sticky. And I used to think, oh, this is going to be less than the in-person experience. And what I found it's, it is less than, it doesn't have the same physical spatial, Kind of, you know, that kind of gut feeling that you get from being in person. But you can see where everybody's standing and you can preserve it. So I'm like, huh, because I used to take photos, but it was never be complete. And you could never tell exactly where everybody's standing. Well, if you have a top view, which is effectively what you're getting in, in mural, you, I take snapshots of every time we answer the question. Now I've got tons of data on this thing. 
about where people tend to stand on these questions, it's actually pretty cool. So one of the things I've been thinking about is, wow, I've been collecting a lot of data lately. I might want to do some mining of that. <laughs> Your own private Google. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, I remember in one of your courses some years ago, you had a betting pool for um, someone who was late the first day, how late they were going to be the second day. And we did a constellation based on that, which was hilarious. Yeah, I do try different things here and there. <laughs> it's nice to see you, Joe, by the way. You've sent a bunch of people to my classes. I do appreciate that. Thank you. There's one more coming in uh, December too. Yeah. I, if you guys had a referral fee, I'd be, I could retire. Yeah. If I had stayed at Apple when jobs came back, I could retire. <laughs> Fair play. <laughs> Other comments, observations, questions? Yeah, there were a bunch of there were there are a bunch of those that are, that's very clear that you probably have done some explanation of, for example, the biases, or for example, um, what to um, how to how to use hypothesis cards because that's just a really busy screen mm -hmm. to uh, mm -hmm. to jump into, and think uh, well, we, ten minutes from now we might actually know what to do with this thing, but on the other hand, the um, the Restore the Agile Manifesto was very easy to get into and, uh, and very obvious what to do and, and fun to play, as was um, it wasn't obvious how to tackle the question of, of principles, but that was very fun. We, we, uh, we got through about a third of them, but uh, or maybe half actually, but, um, but had interesting conversations with each other and, uh, and got one, one, one circle <laughs> one circle placed. Yeah, when it comes to the bias one, it's surprisingly, I actually don't tell them beforehand. What I say is, see if you can guess at how these labels apply to these stories. It's amazing. I swear, 98% of the time, it's obvious enough that they tend to nail it. Mm. Now, the, mm. the, the, the hypothesis cards, that one needs more framing. And the way it fits into the product owner class is I have them come up with a product idea. And then I have them come up with a bunch of product features for that idea. And then I have them do design experiments for those product features. So there's definitely more context going on there. Yeah, the, restore we, the, we, the Restore the Manifesto well, thing kind of stands more on its own. The principles one, I allow a fair amount of flexibility if people want to express what they want to do in the question of principle one, I kind of let them, I kind of don't really restrain it too much. Are we running out of questions? Cause I can move on to facilitation techniques if that makes sense. Well, the, the bias one has a context cause it's in a class. So it's not- I know, but what I mean is I don't explain what those biases mean prior yeah. to doing the right. exercise. So I definitely drop them in a little cold. And there are times as a trainer where pushing people a little out of their comfort zone is a useful thing to do. So I'm, <laughs> if you've been to my trainings and season can attest to this, I definitely practice that kind of way of doing things. <laughs> if you don't mind, Eric, I was gonna uh, make a couple comments about uh, the Zoom breakout rooms in reference to what Hugh was talking about. And not specifically Agile, but because we're teaching Scrum, uh, I find that when you put a group of people in a specific breakout room, because when you're in person, they're at a table and they tend to bond. So we put them in a breakout room, they create their own team name, they start to bond, right? Because they're a little bit isolated from the larger group. So they create sort of this little group mini group identity. And then with the breakouts uh, going back and forth, especially during the simulation that we perform, um, it creates a cadence that we're trying to reinforce anyway. So unlike this kind of session where it's, we're letting people kind of travel around in my training classes, because I'm teaching team-based stuff, I put people into teams and they stay in those teams. So you have to think about the design principle of what is the organizing principle of grouping in this class or workshop or coaching session or whatever it is you're doing? So there's no kind of one way to do this. You really have to think about how are we dividing things up? 
in an open space kind of environment or a meetup or whatever, having people pop around looks like it actually works pretty well. All right, I'm gonna cover some facilitation techniques we'll talk a little bit about. I'm not sure you've been, actually I have to do this more here than I normally do in my classes. Talk, then pause. And if you care about facilitation, you should get really comfortable with uncomfortable pauses. It's, it's a, um, I just, I joined late, but it's funny you mentioned that because where I, I'm a scrum master and um, we have a couple of very, very quiet teams. And whenever I, um, I ask a question or whatever's happening and a couple of consultants we had in said, Deborah, just watch your watch and just watch the seconds, but do not like say anything, you know? And there was like, just today, I think there was like a minute and a half and I'm like thinking, this is so interesting, you know? And no one said anything, and then finally somebody chimed in. But it's it's it's, um, it's interesting. I totally agree with you. I think that's absolutely fascinating. And here's what I do because I'm a talker, and I'll fill the airtime with all the talking you want, and I'll forget that I'm talking the whole time, right? Because I'm a talker. That's what I do. I keep a glass of water on my desk. And I ask a question or I know that I need to pause, I will actually pick up, well, right now, because it's a meetup, I'm drinking beer. But anyway, I would pick up a glass and after asking a question, I would take a drink. That's a nice Forces visual cue just... too, that nothing's gonna come for me for a little while, so you better right. start moving. And it forces me to slow down. Because the people that I know who need a little space to talk, Hey, you know, you got to shut the hell up for a while to give that space. Like I said earlier, everything takes longer. Yeah, and I, want to add, I want, if I may, I'd like to add that. I think there's also the neuroplasticity that plays with it too, because you're basically disrupting whatever is going on with them, especially in a learning situation. Yeah, absolutely. And I also think the phenomenon. So I have a great privilege when I'm teaching because I do Scrum Alliance certified classes, right? Um, the requirement is you have to be on camera to get certified. And what I've discovered is because I've done so most of those 800 plus hours that I've done on Zoom has been everybody on camera. And every once in a while, I'll do something like now or other experiences where you don't have to be on camera. It's not required. And I find it weird. Now, if I had started out with that, I probably wouldn't find it as weird because I'd be used to it. But the fact that I'm so used to seeing everybody's face all the time, I mean, I miss eye contact. I miss body language, all these things, right? But to me, you know, once people are off camera, you have no idea if they're engaged. And as a facilitator, that's heartbreaking. You know, I'm just, it just, it just pains my soul as a facilitator, not knowing whether or not what's going on here is helping you do something that you need to do. That just kills me. Um, breakout rooms, as you discovered, breakout rooms, breakout rooms, breakout. I do in a, in a typical certified Scrum Master class, I do 20 breakout rooms in two days. I don't think it's enough. The requirements for certification are you either two days in person or two days on camera. The most time you can be off camera is 30 minutes over two days. That's how you keep people on camera. That's the requirement. The other thing I've discovered as you, I don't know if you've noticed this, but exaggerate your reactions on Facebook or on Facebook. This is like Facebook, isn't it? Zoom, <clears throat> sorry. Um, this is the worst thing I find when I'm doing Zoom training. Is that a photo? Like, did you take a snapshot? Are you like frozen? Is your bandwidth suck and you can't? I have no idea. I'm getting nothing. And to me, I figure, well, the best thing I could do is at least model the behavior I want. 
And the BVI one is give me some kind of reaction. No, I don't like that. Yes, I do. Hey, I got a question. I, I, I try to move around enough to kind of go, look, this is, this is going to help. Besides, I always joke, I'm like that squirrel in the movie Up. If I see a little bit of movement, I'm like, you know, the dog, rather, the dog. I'm like, squirrel. You know, I just, I'm looking for movement all the time. Raising hands, any kind of visual clue. I hate the raise hand thing in Zoom. It sucks. My cap is 20 people. I don't take classes over 20. Zoom has a limit that where 24 roughly works on a screen unless you go to the maximum, which is like 49. But that means all your thumbnail videos are like tiny. Nah. So I go up to 20. That's my max. I did 22 once. It sucked. And having people use the tools that says raise hand, that, that icon is so tiny. I just don't, I don't see it. As a facilitator, I tend to not visit breakout rooms. I did it a lot in the beginning. I found that kind of observed behavior changed the behavior too much. Showing up kind of changed what was going on in the room and I didn't like the effect I was having. So I tend not to go to the breakout rooms too often these days. I always tell them they can invite me in, I'll go in, I'll show up if they want me to, all that kind of stuff, but I tend to not show up too much. Which is weird because, well, in a way it's weird because if you think about it, if I had a room full of people sitting at a table, showing up the breakout room is exactly like me sitting down at the table. Here I am. I never did that in person. I'd like wander by going, hey, you got a question, and then I'd back away. When you take a room full of people and you flatten everybody's face onto a two-dimensional screen, it's a different experience. When you show up in, in a breakout room, you are affecting what's happening in the breakout room because your face is there. Volker made a great suggestion, which is if you need to do it, turn your video off. That might be a good way to go for it. At least that signals that you're not wanting to participate, that you're present, but you're not actually asserting yeah, that you have a role to play. It's absolutely. The chat can be useful unless there's too much chat. In a context of a meetup or like an open space or some kind of large gathering, it's kind of like Twitter or YouTube comments on a live event. If the chat streams by, who cares? But if you're in a session where you kind of need to know what people are asking when there's too much chat, and we actually had a client one time where they were really friendly with each other and loved talking to each other. It was like 22 people at an HR, they were all HR people at a company down in Silicon Valley. Man, they love chatting on Zoom. And you couldn't tell if there was a legit question or if they were just kept catching up on sort of how, how are your kids and what's going on. And so, you know, sometimes the chat can get out of control. Eric, how did you handle that situation? We actually did say, send out a message saying, hey, just realize the level you're chatting at makes the chat less useful to us facilitators. So just realize we might miss stuff. And they did kind of back off a little bit. I didn't want to squelch it. I don't want to shut people down. I don't want to tell them, hey, stop doing that. I mean, that's, there's some cool energy going on there. I mean, I would hate to get in the way of that. But on the other hand, the tool certainly is not useful for other things. I tell you, when you get to several rooms, my threshold is three. When you get to three breakout rooms, you need help. If you want things to go smoothly, get help. You need to practice with your help. <laughs> Don't go in cold. Don't have somebody show up and go, hey, here's what we're doing. Uh, if you'd love to hear the clarity on requiring video in terms of Scrum Alliance stuff, we'll talk afterward, Bernie, OK? Um, I, I, I just, I don't know. I really prefer being on camera. You know, when I do training, here's something I do. I worry about engagement. And one of the things I do is if you're on your phone in my classes, I walk up behind you, I look at your phone with you, and in a few seconds, the phone disappears. Because, you know, you're in class. Either leave the room, do your phone thing, or stay here. But I can't do that with virtual. 
And so I do all kinds of things to try to make it like, let's stay engaged as much as possible. Being on camera means at least I can see you. Lots of places to check in. Hey, Eric, there was an, I don't know if you know of Adam Grant. I, I really appreciate what he has to say. He posted a link recently on LinkedIn that's about a study that said that people actually do better with engagement. I didn't remember all the details, but their video was actually turned off. Yeah, I've seen some of that stuff. And in fact, one of the things I heard was is definitely better if you have your own video turned off. Not so much other people's is more like looking at yourself. And I have to say, one of the things I don't do in in-person classes is look in a mirror all day. <laughs> right, because what you're doing and when you have your own video on. But I've also found that it's important, especially for the kind of job I do, to be aware of what's on camera. Right. Sometimes I'll have a light. It's like glaring. It's sort of shining. I got a big shadow. I got a big shiny space. I'm, you know, it's like I have to pay attention because I'm kind of as a trainer, you're a little bit on stage a bit, but it kind of depends on the context. So to me, it's like context is everything. It really depends on what you're doing. Seven hundred okay. people. Yeah, we, that's a whole different context altogether. <laughs> that's just it's totally really different. fascinating. They, they, they actually have a, a tech support person. They have a second facilitator and then the speaker. And what happens there and a lot of it, the funny thing is it's actually one of a, like previous months, it was an embodiment course. So you can imagine a bunch of people like going nuts typing on screen and not being present, you know, but overall my, my opinion of it has changed is actually quite good. So I, I kind of leave the door open to what people do with that. One of the pieces of advice I always give when you're listening to me talk is don't take any of my damn advice. <laughs> no, I'm curious. I'm totally dead serious. It, 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 it go try it and see what works. I mean, you might take some ideas and go, oh, I'm going to go try that, but don't assume it's going to work out great. You have no idea. Go try it. Go figure it out. Because I have no idea what your context really is. So I have my experience. You have to go try stuff it, out yourself. Yeah, the, in my situation, it's a coaching. It's a coaching course. So they will spotlight certain people. So in that context, it actually works because they have somebody to demonstrate. You know, they're, they're, there's that type of like, it's lecture style plus coaching. So that kind of format works, but I would never do like breakout rooms with like 700 people. That's like. No, that would be a bit chaotic. <laughs> That's just too many. But yeah, <laughs> 700 people in a coaching course. I wouldn't sign up for that. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about tools. So obviously we're using Zoom. A lot of people use Google Meet or WebEx or BlueJeans or whatever, blah, 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 right? We've mentioned Mural and Miro. I think a bunch of people put a bunch of tools in if you want to go by those idea boards and several others that popped up in the chat. Um, Google Docs, Slides, Sheets, except for people that I know that can't access some of these tools. So sometimes you got to, um, like I know Sasha does some really creative stuff with Google Docs where basically he has people copy the document and then they work on it as a local copy as opposed to being accessing a web application. So, you know, you got to deal with the situation you're in and you got to use the tools that are available to you. But I have found that having a really good quality microphone, I'm not using a, I'm not using a built in mic. I'm definitely not using a built in camera. Um, I have a standing desk so I can go up and down all day long. Second camera. Yeah, it might be a little bit of an indulgence, but given how many hours I do training, having that as a flexible thing that I don't have to set up my whiteboard. It's a huge benefit. And if things go awry, murals down, Google Docs are down, I got my whiteboard. I mean, the way I look at it is this is what it looks like, right? I do, you know, my whiteboard's trying to speak to me here. You know, I, I, you know, my fondness always goes back to whiteboards, stickies, markers, you know, this is the way we like to work. We'll always have each other. And I have a separate camera just pointing here so I can, I can go over here and I can do all kinds of stuff on the whiteboard. And I can spotlight my view in Zoom. I can use this stuff in OBS. So OBS, I tell you, anybody, 
Can I can I get any feedback? Um, anybody using OBS for anything? Do I have any? What's OBS? Season, yeah. Uh, see, OBS is open broadcasting software, and there's a free version. It's open source, basically, called OBS Studio. It's basically a, a TV studio on your desktop. Season, how are you using it? Um, it's really popular for Twitch streamers, uh, video gamers, and creatives on Twitch. You can stream, you can record, or you can go into studio mode, which is the way I use it, which is basically like live television. The reason why you can see my logo in my video is because I'm in, right? So if I wanted to, I could, let me just do this real quick. All right, I'm in studio mode, I can't do it. But anyway, I can add, yeah, there you go. Olaf's doing it. Thanks, Olaf. Cool. So OBS is kind of like you have full control over a whole bunch of content, whether it's images or videos or browser windows or screens or your camera or whatever. And then there's an add-on to OBS called virtual camera, which is what I'm basically telling Zoom I have a virtual camera. And it's whatever's showing up in OBS. So I have full control over all of that. Actually, if I turn it off studio mode, I can basically, if I wanted to, I can, here's my logo, right? I can move it around. I can edit all this content. Ed's just turned off his virtual camera. So that's why you're not seeing that anymore. But this stuff is just, it's, it, I, I can't sing its praises enough. It gives you so much control. And when you're in studio mode, you can sequence everything. It just makes everything so much. Here's my view. Anything you can do to make this stuff more seamless. People stop paying attention to the tools and they're just doing the work. Yeah, a quick question. Um, do you, I was on a meetup the other day and the person said that they had something that was um, uh, basically right in front of them that they could read without actually taking their uh, face away from the camera rather than peering to the side and looking at their notes and what have you. Do you know what that program is? Hmm. I'm not sure. That doesn't sound familiar, but there might be there are a lot of people on this call. There might be somebody who knows. But what are you familiar. using for your teleprompter? You have an iPad yeah. and some. Yeah, it's like a teleprompter, exactly. Oh, oh, teleprompter. So I, I have a side project where I'm going to start recording some pre recorded videos. Uh, what you can't see in my office here is over on this side of my office, there's all these lights and green screen and all this stuff. I'm going to be doing some green screen work, and I found this teleprompter setup where you can aim a camera right through this teleprompter rig. You can set an iPad up with a teleprompter app that costs about 20 bucks. The rig costs about 200 bucks. Mm. And it's voice activated. So if you get a microphone that you hook up to your iPad and you speak into it, so you basically put your script into the teleprompter and it listens to you and it advances as you speak the words. Oh, nice. And you're, aim you're looking directly into the camera while you're doing it. That's cool. And it is freaking awesome. So <laughs> I've got basically, I need to write a storyboard for my video that's coming. Cause I'm, I have a script, but I need to make some mods and I'm going to be shooting some video. I'm hoping to have a few of these that I'm going to publish sort of some explainer stuff or whatever, but got to get one step at a time. I finally figured out the green screens and the lights. So that's where I'm at. Nice. Um, backup, backup, backup. You know, I have Ed in my classes. We have, whenever I do other work for other companies, there's always someone you can contact. Um, I have, I, the first time I did a Scrum Master class, I got a contact, you, a lot of you know Stacy Louie. Stacy Louie texted me and he goes, did you know Mural's down? This was like, I don't know, I just finished up first day. It was like 5.30, 6 o'clock. I'm sitting in the living room watching TV with my wife, drinking a glass of wine. And I get this text, do you know Mural's down? And I'm like, holy crap. I just designed this whole class based around Mural. So I run over to my computer and I'm like, holy crap, Mural is down, face plant down, unavailable, not just barely working, not there. I'm like, okay, I need to refactor the rest of the second day so I know what the hell I'm gonna do tomorrow. So I stayed up to one o'clock in the morning, basically creating everything I was gonna do in Mural for the second day and put it into Google Docs. 
And it turns out some of the stuff I did in Google Docs was better than it was in Mural, so I kept it. But you know what? You, as a facilitator, regardless of the medium, you should be always ready to land back on your feet. It's just the way that job is. Now, here are my basic, like, if you got to remember anything about what I've just said, keep it simple. Slow down. Don't give up on making things better, right? Be agile, always looking to make it better. Test, 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 test. I cannot emphasize that enough. Anytime you're doing something you've never done before, put it in front of somebody who's gonna give you good feedback and find out. There's so many people available in this community. People are always willing to try stuff out. I know so many people who are willing to try this stuff out. Every time I bring this up, kind of, hey, I'm thinking about testing it. I always get positive response. Hey, I'll help you out. Don't ignore that opportunity. Take advantage of the fact that this community is really freaking awesome. I have been involved with this community for, I don't know, 11, 12 years. And yeah, um, if your tools fail you, you better have a backup. Obviously, network bandwidth, your basic camera, zoom, and microphone, you kind of have to have at least that because you can't even connect virtually without it. But anything else that you're reliant upon that you have no backup for is a point of failure. Be prepared to figure out on the fly what you need to do. And always think back, what's this experience like in person? What's it like if we were in the room together, how would it feel? And can I get as close to that as possible? Is there any way that we can sort of recreate what it's like for us to be in the room together? Anything I can do to get me as close as to that, that's what I'm striving for. So it's good to have kind of a North Star when it comes to a design principle. Try to think about what it's like to interact as human beings. And the best experience always is when we're in close proximity together. What can you do to get close to that? You know, the problem with virtual and tools and electronic and Zoom and all this stuff, it's easy to forget to be kind. That's pretty much all I had. And I'm interested in questions. Did I time that well, Volker? Are we good on that? That's that. <laughs> We landed that plane. All right, good. <laughs> question. Stars. I had a question. Uh, when you were talking about OBS, you said something about sequencing. Is that some, what is that? And is that something you use in the course? In, oh, in OBS, um, I'll show you this actually. Let me, let me share this in Zoom. I'll, I'll just do a quick share. We'll do this real quick. OBS has modes, right? So this is sort of editing mode in OBS. OBS has scenes and sources. So I've got all these, like, I've got a timer. If I set my timer up, so I can, here you have got a timer, right? Now, if I put it into studio mode, I get what's everybody's seeing in program and preview is what's next. So I can queue up stuff. Mm and then transition to it. I see. Right? So OBS is basically literally like having a TV studio on your computer. Nice. And you could do recording. You could actually do this. You could almost do this kind of like using Adobe Premiere, edit video and composite and do all kinds of things. There's some, the, I have to say that one thing about OBS that I find a little bit weak is the audio. It's not great integrated with audio, but it's got the video side down. <laughs> and you can incorporate all kinds of sources. So for example, if you look at Ed's video right now, he's showing some of the artwork. It's just a reference to an image file. It shows up in, as a part of his camera in OBS. 